Hello, Brian, and welcome back to Japan by River Cruise. I'm Bobby Judo. And I'm Oli Horn. And joining us this week is Mark Matsumoto, culinary creator who runs the YouTube channel and food blog, No Recipes. He also hosts NHK World's Bento Expo, a show that has, for six years, been rejecting our submission of a riverboat mento made entirely out of fried fish spines. Mark, thanks for joining us. It's great to be here, Bobby. On this week's show, the world loves Japanese cuisine, but when does fusion cross the line into appropriation? What do Japanese people think of foreign Nihon Yori? And how come Western chefs can be so quick to claim mastery over Japanese dishes, while Japanese cooks have to spend 10 years just studying the tamago? These questions and more, plus Ali's got your weekly river cruise recommendation. Ali? Yes, Bobby, this week I'm very pleased to say that with all of the money that they made from selling socks, Family Mart Convenience Store is sponsoring a special river cruise this month, the Fami Chiki River Cruise. I know nothing else about the cruise other than it's related to Fami Chiki, so I know that it will be perfect. If you'd like to hear Ali talk more about that, tune into this week's The Convini Boys. Also, Japan's <laughs> river cruise gears up for the return of international tourism. And for you international tourists out there, don't forget, for a hassle-free entry into Japan, you'll want to have proof of fully vaccinated status, observe the reduced length quarantine period, and not be a man with a ponytail, apparently. More on that later, but first, Soap Talk. <laughs> Unfortunately, Brian had a conflict this week, but he was kind enough to pre-record a message for us to play. Uh, Ali, can you edit that in in post? Uh, to be honest, not really. It's pretty tricky. Should we just wait till next week where you can do it in person? Yeah, that's fine. Uh, Mark, you are a food expert. Uh, thoughts on the LDP leadership election that happened today? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a, um, you, you, you tossed me a curveball. Um, <laughs> No, if you <laughs> <laughs> that's that's I, fine. I, you know what Bobby and I were, were saying before we were recording that we we have to like Bobby and I have to really read up on Japanese politics stuff in order to not seem like a complete morons in front of our expert guests. Whereas food like Bobby and I, we talk about food more than anything else. Mm -hmm. Like when yeah. Bobby and I used to be friends before we uh, became bickering colleagues as a result of having this weekly deadline, like Bobby and I like were enthused about food more than anything else. So th this for me, this episode is a complete indulgence and and also you don't have to worry about uh not being up on politics at all uh, i was i was doing a job with a crew of japanese people today and i kept asking them questions about what the leadership election meant and none of them had any idea and one of them kept referring to kono taro as kawano <laughs> it was insane well at least they didn't refer to them as Taro Kono. The only reason we even brought it up in this soap talk is because we have to say congrats to us on our last show because we successfully predicted the results of the election. And we don't need to specify which person on the show predicted what. What's important is that our show, <laughs> which you and I, Ali, produce, yielded the That's correct right. prediction. We're very proud of ourselves. Yeah. Right. Politics aside, because it is boring and also nothing's going to change. There's going to be a new prime minister in two years. That's my prediction. Two years. I was thinking like two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> two months. Man, if you if you get this right, you're then going to come back on the show now for every other politics episode you do. <laughs> I'll hold you to that. Mark, the reason I was so excited to get you on is because your uh, website, No Recipes, follows a philosophy which Bobby kind of taught me while I was in Japan, which is as long as you understand what, e what each ingredient in a dish does, you have this kind of new found confidence in the kitchen that a recipe isn't like, it, it isn't kind of a, a fence post, it's more of a signpost guiding mm -hmm. you as to, as to how to achieve the end result. So for listeners who haven't come across your potentially inappropriately named No Recipes recipe blog, uh, can you tell us a bit about how it started? Sure. So my background is in, in tech, and I moved out to New York from the West Coast uh, to pursue a job out there. And I didn't know anybody out there at the time. So I started inviting friends and friends of friends over to, to dinner parties. And one of the things I didn't have really inevitably get asked is how'd you make that what's the recipe and my answer was always kind of uh i don't know uh you know i yeah. don't use recipes so um partially for myself partially for my friends i actually started writing down and documenting these recipes that i made for these dinner parties uh, and that was kind of the start of no recipes um as it grew i started hearing from readers that uh you know, they were not no recipes people, that they, they absolutely had to have a recipe because that's the type of person they were. 
And mm. my answer is always, no, you're not. Like everybody can cook without recipes. But, you know, the difference is the level of experience you have and the sort of the tool chest of techniques that you have behind it. So that's kind of when I, I realized there's this demand for, you know, an interest in pe for people to learn how to cook without recipes. Um, and I felt like I had the, the tools and the ability to be able to teach people that. So my mm. recipes are actually kind of the opposite um, of these sort of current, you know, three ingredient, five step recipes that take five minutes to make. Um, and I actually go into a lot of detail for each of the ingredients, why I add them, uh, each of the processes I explain. You know, most recipes will just tell you brown the onions, add the meat, brown the meat, add the sauce, mm -hmm. boom, you're done. But, you know, I'll actually go into detail and say, well, you're browning the onions for the Maillard reaction, which creates a bunch of flavor compounds that make them taste a lot better. You know, you're browning the meat for the same reason. Um, you know, you're simmering, not boiling because you want the meat to get tender and not tough. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, these are all the sort of uh, whys, not just the, the hows. Uh, and that's what I aim to teach on my site. Well, this is this is the science of cooking, which Ali and I could talk about forever. I think in our main uh, main section, we want to get a little bit more into the culture of cooking. But just real quick, how did you work your way into uh, Japanese cooking as kind of your niche right now? Sure. So um, uh, growing up, my mom, single mom, uh, she was uh, in the U.S., didn't speak a ton of English and, you know, was looking at ways of earning a living and raising me. And, uh, you know, one of those was that she was trained in Japanese cuisine. So she started teaching Japanese cooking classes out of our house. Um, so I was kind of her sous chef at uh, age four or five. Um, and it was a way I bonded with my mother and with my, my you know, my heritage um, and something that I was always interested in. So I think that that was kind of the start. And then mm. I just enjoyed eating so uh you know in order to eat great food one of the best ways is, is to cook it yourself um so uh you know i fell further and further down the rabbit hole until i realized you know i i might have something that i i could i uh share with others and help them learn how to cook and and do you see your role as kind of demystifying a bit of japanese cooking because although japanese cooking is full of very complex ingredients and i'm sure we'll talk about that in the news section at its fundamentals, you can, you can cook a dish quite simply, can't you? Absolutely. Um, you know, I think um, I, I come at it from a little bit of a different perspective. I mean, I, I grew up uh, in the U.S. I was born in Japan, but grew up in the U.S. And I grew up during the Internet age where, you know, of course, you share everything on the Internet for free because that's just what you do. And, you know, I think um, classically trained Japanese chefs, they're very much about keeping their secrets close to the vest, you know. They mm -hmm. spent uh, you know, 10 years learning how to make tamagoyaki or how to make the best dashi and where to, you know, what fishermen to, uh, to go source your katsobushi from, uh, you know, what area of Hokkaido you get your kombu from, you know, is it Rishidi, is it uh, Laosu, like, you know, yeah. these are all the little sort of trade secrets. Japan's very sim simple in its ingredients, you know, it's like dashi, soy sauce, sake, and, you know, a few other things, but it's like, you know, what uh, brewery, uh, did you get that sake from and, uh, you know, what season and what water did they, what well did they get the water from for that? Um, <laughs> these are the things that yeah. make small but significant differences. And these are things that the chef would never share with you because they felt like they've, you know, spent their lifetime uh, earning uh, earning that and, and figuring it out. Yeah. And it's not something, mm. there isn't a culture of sharing that with, uh, with others. Uh, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, I mean, they, they spent their life. Their, it's their life's work, literally. Um, you know, for me, on the other hand, like I, I try to make Japanese food accessible. So I want to try to sort of uh, this is a really bad uh, analogy, but, uh, you know, open the kimono and <laughs> share, uh, <laughs> share sort of the, the secrets of uh, Japanese cuisine with the world. <laughs> right. Well, in the news section, we're going to have a chat about whether Bobby and I are even allowed to open your Japanese kimono. Uh, before we do so, a quick thank you to everyone who continues to support the show at buymeacoffee.com. Uh, there are people that support us with a monthly membership and also those that give us one-off donations. We're grateful for both. If you'd like to join them, you can do so at buymeacoffee.com forward slash Japan by River Cruise. And with that, shall we jump into the news? <laughs> Bob, 
Bobby Judo, what's in the news this week? I recently came across Clarissa Way's post on Twitter about people who crown themselves experts in Asian culture after just a short time there. And I really enjoyed reading about the ways that people connected that phenomenon to food. Uh, it reminded me of, of so much stuff I've seen in the last year. And uh, since Mark is kind of uniquely positioned to talk about uh, the way Japanese cuisine gets approached by foreign countries and the way it gets received by non-Japanese people, I really wanted to get your opinions on this idea of culinary cultural appropriation. Yeah, it, it's a it's a difficult issue. I mean, it's it's super complex. There's so many levels in which um, in, in which in, in so many different ways that I can respond to that. Um, but I, I think I think to, to kind of break it down, to take a step back, um, if you look at cuisine and the progression of cuisine, cuisine and where we're at today, uh, it's all happened because people migrated around the world and brought ingredients and brought cooking techniques with them and, you know, melded them with, with uh, you know, whatever was available locally. For example, if some Italian dude hadn't been audacious enough to use a tomato in their pasta, uh, you know, four or five hundred years ago, uh, Italian cuisine wouldn't be the way it is now. You know, basil and garlic also came from Asia. Um, so, I mean, these are all ingredients that at some point, some maverick decided, hey, I'm, you know, the hell with the, with tradition and, and what I was taught to do, I'm going to do something different. Uh, and, you know, that's what contributed to the cuisine as it is today. Korean food, mm. um, chili peppers, you know, native to South America, uh, you know, obviously those came in at some point. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people imagine Korean food as being, you know, spicy food and that wasn't the case a couple of hundred mm. years ago. So, uh, you know, I think any cuisine you look at, um, you know, that sort of like nativist idea of this is Italian food, this is French food, this is Japanese food. I think it's, mm. it's a lot of BS because you're looking at a one snapshot in time. So when do we get into trouble? I'm thinking specifically of an incident that was, I think, April of this year in California. It was the, the chef David Schlosser got in trouble for posting a picture of Sakura Mochi on Instagram. And in his caption, he talked about how it was this very traditional Japanese dish. And it was this huge shame. And it was so sad that Japanese restaurants run by Japanese people in California didn't serve this. And he even went as far as to say in his caption that these Japanese run Japanese restaurants didn't understand the tradition and what Japanese cuisine was about. Um, and he, he, he was even worse in that when, you know, Japanese people started to speak up and go, well, hey, Sakura Mochi are not typically served at restaurants. They're served at Wagashi shops, which we have here. Uh, he, he was like policing their comments and deleting those voices. So in an incident like that, do you see it as, as a little bit different than this idea of just kind of everybody getting to cook everything? Yeah, I mean, it, it's difficult. I mean, I don't think he meant... Uh, he meant it. He wasn't trying to be racist or he wasn't trying to demean uh, the Japanese American community. Um, I think, you know, he's achieved a certain level of success in his career. Um, and so, you know, with that comes a certain level of respect and, you know, sort of perceived respect. So, I mean, I think, mm. you know, he has a sort of a sense of entitlement to some extent to be able to, right. to claim what's right or wrong uh, with the cuisine. Um, you know, I... I don't necessarily agree with that, but uh, I don't think he was, you know, trying to to do some to do harm. Um, of course, no. you could say that for a lot of uh, racist and, and, and issues like sure. that. Um, it comes out of a place of, of not knowing any better. Partially, it comes out of a place of entitlement. Some ego is thrown in there. Uh, it's just a, it's a mm. toxic mix that can lead to a lot of misunderstandings. Yeah, obviously, in this instance, right, David Schlosser was wrong. And so it was absolutely fair game that people were responding saying, yeah, listen to these Japanese people in Japan. <laughs> that's, not, that's not how things are. But it reminded me of kind of the, the polar opposite case where a, a few months back, somebody on Twitter screenshotted a picture of a book called Dumplings and Noodles written by an author called Pippa Middlehurst and a picture of her very white face. And the caption was, why did a white woman write a cookbook about dumplings and noodles? And it started doing the rounds because people were going, yeah, yeah, leave it to the Chinese. Who on earth does she think she is? And then with a bit of digging, uh, someone 
pointed out that like she learned about Asian cooking for 15 years. She attended a noodle school in China. And also people were saying, you know, just like you said, noodles weren't even originally Chinese, right? Noodles have existed in loads of other countries. And so this kind of threw to light the fact that probably this lady, Pippa Middlehurst, has like more credentials to teach about noodles than the majority of the Chinese population. And so, you know, it does make me wonder what credentials are necessary. You are a really interesting case study that you've obviously got the the authentic Japanese credentials from the fact that you grew up eating Japanese food with your Japanese mother. But a lot of your expertise have obviously come not from the fact that you've got, you've got Japanese heritage, but just the fact that you're a curious, smart, interested guy that has learned about Japanese food in the same way that anyone around the world could have done. So do you have any thoughts on to whether it's ever appropriate to kind of gatekeep uh, who's allowed to participate in, in these kind of discussions? I, I do and I don't. I, you know, like I said, it's a complex issue that you can take a lot of views on this. So to give some context around this, like, you know, I live in Japan now, uh, but I grew up in the U.S. And I would never say that I'm a, a washoku chef, that I, you know, I specialize in, in Japanese cuisine. Uh, you know, I say that I create sosaku dori, which means, you know, like sort of creative, original, mm. original cuisine. Um, you know, mm -hmm. because that's, for me, that's what a, a chef does, right? You don't... Uh, a cook follows recipes and follows instructions and does what his chef tells him to do. But a chef creates, he innovates and creates new things. Uh, and I think that's what makes cuisine interesting. You know, obviously we need to respect culture. We need to respect history. And I think to that effect, um, you know, chefs that are innovating owe it to the, the culture to actually go there and learn about ramen or sushi or pasta in Italy. You know, you have a, a, a lot of Japanese chefs that study in France, in Italy, and then they come back and open Italian or French restaurants here, but they don't call themselves an Italian restaurant or a French restaurant because they're not making traditional food. They're taking the influences and the techniques that they learned in those places and bringing mm -hmm. them back to Japan using Japanese ingredients. And I think that's, that's fair game to do with anything, with, with Japanese cuisine to take it abroad as well. But you first have to understand the soul of the dish uh, before you can go and start to to modify it mm. um, and still be able to call it that dish. I want to take this in two directions. One is this, again, this Clarissa Way's post, this concept of mastery, and which which to me, having lived in Japan for a long, long time, you you get that sense that people in Japan, as, as many people in the thread pointed out, Japanese chefs don't claim mastery. I, I was even reminded of it when you said you would never call yourself a washoku chef. My instinct was to go, oh, how Japanese of you? Because you don't, <laughs> you don't, it's this humble culture, right? You can study it for years, but you don't become the master chef. Whereas, as you just mentioned, somebody might study for a couple of years and then go back and take that home to their home country and open up a Japanese restaurant in their own home country. So, do, do you see a real difference in terms of people's comfort level in claiming mastery? That, that, I think part of that is a cultural thing. Um, I think, uh, you know, culturally, uh, from a chef's culture, obviously for, from a Japanese versus Western culture difference as well. But I think, um, you know, chefs in Japan, it, it's not, it's about the, the pride that you take in the food that you create and in, in your craft. And it's not about becoming famous or having a TV show or, you know, getting Michelin mm. stars. I mean, I, some of the best Japanese restaurants in Japan have turned down Michelin stars or they don't even let the reviewers come to the restaurant to review them because they don't want mm. the attention. Um, they want to focus on improving their craft. And I really have to respect that. I mean, that's that's amazing. But at the same time, because they're not speaking, because they're not the loudest voice in the room, you have a lot of other people mm that maybe are culturally more comfortable in bragging or showing off. Uh, yeah. And so they end up being the loudest voice in the room that gets heard, which is, which is a little unfortunate, but mm. what can you do? Well, that's the other direction that I wanted to take this um, because it's not just a cultural comfort level. I think it's also, um, it, uh, there was a really good article in Eater by uh, a, a woman, uh, Dr. Min Chan, and she was talking about how um, white people have more cultural and social and financial capital that allows them to explore these minor spaces in cooking and, and get more attention. And she was talking especially about fermentation uh, foods and the boom in fermented foods and how right now in these spaces where you're talking about kombucha, you're talking about kimchi, you're talking about Japanese fermented food, it's all dominated by white people. 
But by the and way, so, uh, I have to jump in there with kombucha. Um, do you guys know how the name came about? Uh, no, I have always been curious about this so, because it, um, ha it has nothing to do. Kom kombu, it, as I understand it, is Japanese seaweed. Yeah, it's kelp. So um, there's there's yeah. an actual beverage here called kombucha, which is made with kombu kelp. It's kelp yeah, yeah. steeped in hot water. So it's a savory, like lots of umami, soothing tea. It's not fermented. Yeah, but Mark, we're talking about kombucha. <laughs> Tell us about the history of kombucha. <laughs> but uh, we do have another beverage here that's fermented that translates roughly to mushroom tea, uh, referring to the fungus mm. that grows in there. Um, and I think what happened was somebody came to Japan at some point and uh, had a bunch of different teas, including kelp tea and including this fermented mushroom tea. And they got the two names mixed up and they went back to the U.S. or wherever. Yeah. Uh, started a company and was like, hey, let's sell kombucha. Um, it, you know, it's the same with uh, right now. The, there's a trend in burning wood and cedar. Like, you know, in Japan, there's the cladding on the outside of the houses to prevent them from rotting. They burn them first. So they're, um, they char them on the outside. And yeah. uh, it's called yaki sugi. Sugi is cedar, and yaki is to, to burn. Uh, but right, right. When you, if you misread the kanji, it could also be read shosugi. So uh, it's called shosugi ban in the U.S. And you show that you, to the Japanese person, and they're like, "What country did that come from?" And I'm like, "You know, yeah. that's actually Japanese." And they're like, "No, it's not." And you show them the kanji, and they're like, "Oh, you mean yaki sugi?" Uh, so I think there's a lot of these sort of like misunderstandings yeah. that that lead to these. Uh, uh, cultural phenomena abroad. Uh, one of the funniest experiences I had was uh, working as kind of like a TV presenter slash local coordinator and translator. And I took a group of Japanese people to Umami Burger in Los Angeles. And we had a white waiter at in Los Angeles explain to a group of Japanese people how the burgers were made with yuzu gosho, which was a kind of seaweed. Oh. <laughs> which it is not. <laughs> It's a citrus pepper paste. And it was so like I had to translate what he was saying to them. And everybody kind of like went, you just translated that wrong. And I was like, no, I, did I did not. not. <laughs> did he explain what umami was as well? Yeah, yeah, uh, he did. And uh, all the Japanese people like nodded very happily and were like, we did that. <laughs> <laughs> that was our that was our invention. <laughs> Which, which wasn't recognized by the scientific community until relatively recently, even though uh, Professor Ikeda, who, create, who discovered uh, glutamate uh, out, and isolated out of, of, out of kelp, kombu, um, it, you know, found this about 100, over 100 years. It was like 1906. Uh, so, you know, it just goes to show, like, um, I, I hate to claim racism, but like, you know, I... I Definitely it in probably the scientific is. community. Yeah, um, I, I, yeah. I, I, I think it's I think it's a, a really good example of like so, some innovation was done by a non-white person, and then I don't know the actual history, but I'm guessing like some YouTuber discovered it, and then that's how we all got MSG, <laughs> something like that. Uh, TikTok. Well, th this is ex <laughs> yeah. it speaks exactly to the point that we're discussing. Again, it's like the people who have the microphone silencing the minority voices, and in this Eater article about the fermented foods, uh, Dr. Chan was saying, like because white people start speaking and become the voice of, you know, kimchi toasties or become the voice of kombucha or whatever, you've then set the bar higher and created more of a barrier for someone else to come get into that space when it's right. already difficult for someone who doesn't have the same social capital. Right. So, for example, if a Japanese person wants to present their recipe of a, uh, of a Japanese curry sauce, to an Eng to a UK market, they'd now have to call that the katsu curry sauce, and now katsu, right. K A T S U, means a fruity curry, curry sauce. sauce, right? Right, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And you know that that happened really quickly. I mean, that happened before I moved to Japan in 2014. That didn't exist. I've come back. It's now now like you get like in major sandwich chains like a katsu s sandwich, and that's not a katsu sando. Right. It doesn't have any katsu in it. It just has like some chicken with a curry sauce on top. And let's not forget that katsu is a word that's an abbreviation for katsuretsu, which is cutlet. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Which, yeah, which, which has <laughs> nothing it. to do with this at all. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I mean, so that's actually a great example because you're taking it full circle. You know, I think we're talking about white people misappropriating Asian culture and cuisine, but it goes both ways. I mean, 
You know, I yeah. don't know if you guys have ever had an American dog uh, here in Japan, but uh, yes. Oh yeah, yeah. I, the first time I heard dog. about it, I was like, I'm American, and I've never heard of an American dog. They show it to me, and it's a corn dog. So you know, like I think there's there's uh, the street goes both ways. So no, you're absolutely right. I, I went to a Japanese-run British pub, and they served really delicious, colorful food, and I was angry because that's not how we do it here. <laughs> <laughs> Give me gray and brown. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I want 50 shades of beige, please. If you want 50 shades of beige, go to Mujirushi Yohin's fall fashion lineup. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I think we could all probably agree that that we don't need gatekeeping when it comes to just cooking and enjoying cuisine from all over the world and, and having that cross-pollination. But when you get to a point where you've got a majority culture presenting and claiming ownership or as David Schlosser did saying, you know, the Japanese community doesn't understand the value of Japanese food in a way that negatively affects or removes the ability for the or the culture that originated the cuisine to profit financially off of it. Then you've kind of got got an issue. Yeah, I mean, you could also say the same for like Wagyu or Kobe Gyu. You know, like Wagyu mm. means Japanese beef. Oh. Kobe beef is beef from Kobe. But uh, yeah, for the been listeners who, who don't know Japanese, Wagyu is uh, is Japanese for Wagyu beef. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah but so pronunciation point, right? aside. In, in, an, in an American restaurant, it's the cattle, right? Like it will be the Wagyu cattle that have been raised on American farms rather than imported from Japan. Is that right? There's no such thing as Wagyu, though. It's not a breed of cattle. There's uh, there's four different breeds of cattle that comprise Wagyu historically, uh, but mm. none of them are called Wagyu. Uh, Wagyu just right. means literally Japanese beef. It means beef that comes yes. from Japan. So it'd be kind of like me selling American beef here in Japan that's raised here in Japan. You know, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, right. But you know, they've capitalized it on a, as a way to sell mark, um, market things at a premium. And the, the sad thing about this is like, um, you know, you go talk to most Americans now and you say, you know, what do you think about Wagyu? And for the people that haven't, they're like, oh, you know, it's some really expensive beef. But for the people that have tried uh, American Wagyu, they're like, I don't get what's so special about it. It costs four times as much and it doesn't taste that much different. And yeah. You bring that same person to Japan and have them try A5 grade Matsuzaka Wagyu, like actually from Japan. And they're like, that was like unlike anything I've ever had before. You know, it's, it's a really uh, game changing, mind changing. Whether they like it or not, is something separate, but it is something completely unique. Yes. Um, yeah. And it's really sad to see those kind of things happen where, uh, where a brand or a name uh, is mm -hmm. taken and used in a way that that tarnishes it for for mm. uh for the future and yeah. i think you know europe has the same problem with cheeses and wines and things like that so yeah but in europe we have like laws to protect certain words and certain certain characteristics to make sure that those heritages are, are protected and those communities can can profit from the goodwill that they built up and then there are countries that find ways around it you know like in the u.s we sell parmesan cheese they can't call it parmigiano reggiano but they can call it parmesan <laughs> Uh, and right. there are lots of ways to kind of get around those rules. The example that popped up uh, in my mind in terms of kind of like just taking the Japanese idea as a brand uh, is green tea. Because if you ask most Americans what they think of green tea, uh, they'll immediately think of Arizona green tea, which yes. does have all the antioxidants in it, but it also has enough sugar to give you diabetes. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, thanks very much for listening to this episode, Ichimaru Ni of Japan by River Cruise. If you've enjoyed the show, please be sure to leave a review, ideally positive, wherever you're listening to this. And thanks to our guest this week, Mark Matsumoto. Mark, before you go, Ali and I uh, love to make curry. We would like to know what your kakushi aji, your, your secret ingredient that's, that's your go-to when you're making a curry is. Cocoa powder. I, I know it sounds mm. crazy, but it really works and it's a great way to speed up the cooking process so you can make it taste like it's been simmering for three hours and 15 minutes. I just posted a video on my YouTube channel for Katsukare where I show you how to make a 15 minute curry sauce. So go check it out. Cocoa wow. powder from Mark. Ali, what's your secret ingredient? Um, SMB mild golden curry cubes. <laughs> Thanks for listening and we'll see you next week. <laughs>